Fucking hell, you are kidding me. All of you, all of you, how dare you? Didn't you learn anything yesterday? I mean, come on! This is where it really hurts. Touch those How fucking dare you? How dare you? All of you, get over there, take your fucking shit and eat it and let me know. Just see what we're about to send out. Fuck off you. Down. All of you. Down. Let's go. Firstly, I would like to apologise for the wait on this one, you know, personal reasons. But anyway, it's come to this. Here is my review of Disappointment Warriors 9 and fucking hell, just what were Koei thinking with this one? This has to be one of the least enjoyable moments in my life, playing this game and writing this review. It feels like a mercy kill in a way. But before we start, I would like to say I have nothing wrong with people enjoying this game. In fact, I'm happy that people can enjoy this game. I wish I could, I really do. But one thing I cannot accept is people calling this fucking game the best Dynasty Warriors yet. How? How is this the best one? Well, thinking about it, the only people that would call this broken, empty mess the best game in the series are people that have only played this one. The game is so far removed from being a Dynasty Warriors game that it cannot be the best one. And to add to that, it's only just a functional piece of software. Whereas the other eight main games didn't need to be patched just to get closer to an acceptable frame rate. Let's remember as well, enjoying something doesn't mean it's good. Just like how people enjoy, you know, Sonic 06 and the film The Room. So in my opinion is that I don't like this game and I loathe the very idea of Koei using this game as a base for future titles. So TLDR, if you want to click out the video now, the game is fucking terrible. My opinion of this game has actually gone down since I first started playing it, Jesus Christ. And the other amazing excuse this game has gotten is, you hate it because it's different, or no one likes change, you can't accept change. Yeah, because if, you know, McDonald's started selling Big Macs, but replaced the burger with a load of dog shit instead, that somehow makes it better because it's different. Fucking sort your fucking lives out. Is that the best excuse people have to defend this fucking wank? It's absolutely fucking a joke. Jesus Christ, if the game is so good, why don't you go and fucking play it? Jesus Christ. So, sorry, after that rant... <laughs> Dynasty Warriors 9 is the series first time going open world and by going I mean cashing in on. The series in my opinion is just utterly ruined by it and just the open world doesn't benefit the series at all. All it's done is get some people's dicks hard by saying I've been saying for years they should make it open world and this shit heap is the result. The amount of bad decisions this game has made is just mind boggling as well as being an utter PR disaster with the excuse of removing weapons as they wanted realism, which is a hilariously bad excuse or just, you know, a PR slip up. As you know, you've got to say something suitable when someone questions you on your shitty move for your series to take and something that's also pissed off like 70% or more of your fan base. The apparent line for this game and its design is renewal because, and I quote, the development team strove to refresh the one-man superhero experience from the ground up. I wonder why? It's almost like people are burned out from Koei releasing so many games using the same assets with little variation on them, and releasing some games like Extreme Legends and Empire spin-offs, which could be better off as DLC expansions at this point. You know what, you'd actually do better if you did that? I stole quite a bit of toxicity, a word everyone's throwing out about this game from both sides, people giving abuse to anyone who likes the game, and on the other hand people who like the game calling people who criticise it not real fans, or a classic comment I got calling me cancer for disliking this game. Wow. There's one person people who uh, defend this game like to blame as well because he rustled some jimmies and that would be Jim Sterling, you know, an obvious joke there, rustling some jimmies. Which honestly, some of the arguments against him are hilariously funny, like this screenshot. And Jim makes an unfair representation of the game. Really? So you're going to tell me the open world isn't fucking empty? Also, I find it funny that people say he's wrong but never elaborate on it. 
I'm guessing because, you know, you, you can. Now, I don't agree with Jim on everything, especially when he talks about clones, and some of his jokes were pretty cringe, even more than mine. Also, I do like that if Jim is so wrong, why don't you make your own review about the game? I mean, if, if it's easily defendable, you can make your own video reviewing the game saying it's the best. You know, there are actually some, you know, decent reviews from people saying they love the game. So you could do that. You could turn the tide. But no, you just have to sit there, oh, he's wrong about this. And then when you're asked why he's wrong, you crumble like a shit biscuit. Well done. Be review! So yeah, if you're a fan of this series, apparently you've got to give this game a free pass. I'm guessing I'm not going to be a real fan at the end of this video. So with this review, I will do my best to justify my position on why I think this game is the worst in the series. Some of it I have sort of just given up. I This is so depressing just talking about this game. The game itself is just pretty depressing. So this game was made to celebrate the series 20th anniversary and just like Dynasty Warriors 6 before it, decided to radically change the series for some strange reason. And to be honest, with this one, the series might be dead with the aftermath of the failure it's been. The 20th anniversary, meaning they're celebrating everything great about the series, and it should be the game fans have wanted for years. But this game is the opposite. And the stuff people did like is thrown out for an empty open world. I just cannot fucking comprehend why this game turned out this way, and who it was even marketed at. Another thing I can't comprehend is the producer of this game is the same one for Warriors Archie 3, which is considered one of the best Maso games. Warriors Archie 3 being a game which built upon the features of the two previous games in the series as well, as the two games it's based off of, you know, Dynasty Warriors Next and or 7, and Samurai Warriors 3Z. Well, now that I've said that, Warriors Archie 4 has been announced, and I hope to God it doesn't get fucked harder than this series. My guess, there is a 50% chance of that happening. Before we get too ahead of ourselves, I want to bring this up again, mainly to rub salt in the wounds and because it's funny. This is a quote from Ko Shibusawa, who is Koei's CEO. In response to the financial failures being reported by AAA publishers despite selling millions of copies, Shibusawa replied that it's not the costs for production which are critical for success, it's cherishing the demands of fans. <laughs> he believes that millions of yen spent just for the sake of high quality production is not a very practical business for any company, niche or major. In this age, if it continues to alienate a company's core fan base, Shibusaro applies that the development teams within Koei work under considerable financial restraint to avoid falling into this business pitfall while simultaneously providing a creative challenge for developers. I really like the line, development teams within Koei work under considerable financial restraint to avoid falling into the business pitfall. Uh, mainly because you know it's a bit counterintuitive you know you need to spend money to make money and judging by this game the little amount of money they spent making the game shows especially when it comes to the dubbing effort games like neo made by you know the other side of the company uh, tecmo koei show that they can make fucking great games when they're given the time and the money to do so i also like the line it's cherishing the demands of fans w what demands of the fans are cherished in this game for a game that's supposed to celebrate 20 years of the series we got nothing well done glitches now i'm not going to talk about them because everyone has a different experience when it comes to how these things work but it's utterly pathetic that this game was allowed to release in this state so enjoy this montage of them here from things like textures not rendering correctly to enemies disappearing in midair and the like. So enjoy. Shit, though. I mean, you sold me at Waifu. Well, no, why Waifu. Is this health, why is Hang this on, what? Health, why is his health decreasing? Yeah, I was wondering that. Why, why did he just suddenly die?
Are we ready? It looks like Cao Cao's army has fallen for our false report. Father, I've brought you the paperwork that you've requested. Father? No! Father! Father! <laughs> Don't lose your composure, Chen Yi. Destroy the enemy. I won't let anyone thwart our advance. Brother from the enemy assassins. I need to gather as much information as possible. Yeah. To find him. Let's go. Now is the time to attack. We shall defend this position. Do not allow a single enemy through. <laughs> I can't take you with suits. I don't know. I, I, now I can't even take all these people disappearing seriously. Look at them with their N64 way of movement. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> they're, call, they're, they're calling on the extra Oh my fucking days. <laughs> I, I have never seen anything like this in my life. <laughs> Oh my god, you know what, I'm actually gonna I'm actually gonna do a shadow recording of that because that's so funny. You are shining brightly as a result of your efforts out there. It's time to take the attack to the enemy. Forward! Now, take defensive positions. Defeat way must take this base. You attack with true strength and vitality. I will have to risk my life to stop you. Things I actually liked about the game. Before we get too far and too negative, I will point out some things I do like about this game. So here goes. Weather. Some of the weather effects are pretty cool in my opinion. The game features rain, wind and snow, and they happen at random. Some of the in-game events. Uh, this time, some of the events are better, like uh, Jahudun's eye scene, which I don't know if it's a bug, but I played as Sao Tsao and missed the eye scene as it's linked to an optional objective. And because I didn't get it, he still had both eyes, even up to Chibi. I call it a bug because I've had it whilst playing as a Wu officer on a stage that was later than Chibi. And some of the events as well, we got uh, new ones uh, which were previously not shown, like Yujin Surrender. I do also like the character endings and I like the premise, keyword premise, of character stories this time. Um, the detail of the story. The story does really go into much more detail this time, even if some of it is really fucking stupid. like. Everyone figuring out that Cao Cao, or Tsai Tsai, leads all his forces to Han Zhong in an effort to lure out Guan Yu to attack Von Castle, and how Sun Xuan is forced to attack Guan Yu. This time he's kind of blackmailed into it. You know, I, I wish I was joking. Anyway, the sheer amount of dialogue in this game is probably comparable to some visual novels. In addition, several of the stories go further than they have in the previous games, like Wei now covers Sai Pi's rule, Shu is now playable until the battle of the Chengdu invasion and other forces except for Lubu are now more in depth and I would say they're probably the best stories in this game. 
and the ones I had, you know, the most enjoyment uh, playing. Characters now get dirty when fighting. I like that. It adds a small sense of actually being on a battlefield, which I should add, I think it was a feature that was said to be in Dinosaur Wars 8. And uh, characters getting wet as well in the rain and when they swim, as uh, well as the oversight of them getting fully wet while on a horse in water. So, you know. Uh, freedom in battles. Uh, something the games have moved away from since Dinosaur Wars 6, which is something that I really missed from the good old days, as Dinosaur Wars 7 and 8 are way too linear, and there's only one real way to complete stages. Not that that was a bad thing in Dinosaur Wars 7 due to the nature of the storytelling, but yeah, it was pretty. It's pretty fun going back to having that sort of freedom. I should mention now that quite a few of the things are like are really poorly implemented. The weather is one of those, and how characters just stand there in the rain. Koei could have made it so only certain weather effects would happen during conversation events, or not at all. It's just really awkward when it's dark, it's raining, and they're just standing in the middle of nowhere. Like, why are you not standing inside? What I don't like, everything else basically. But seriously, the things I hate about this game the most would be the emptiness and the repetitiveness of the open world. Uh, characters changing weapons, uh, clones, which most people should know my opinion on, character stories, which I said I liked the premise of, or liked the idea of, the implementation is fucking atrocious. It's essentially the same battle for everyone, no unique stages or anything like that for anybody. For example, characters who fight for someone else before or after joining their assigned kingdom aren't playable during that time. So characters like Pong De, Ma Chao and Ma Dai aren't playable as the Shi Liang forces. No Xiahu Ba in Shu, Zhang Liao under Lu Bu or Dong Zhuo. So all the characters affected by this are Xiahu Ba, Jia Xu, Guan Yu um, doesn't actually fight under Saxo this time. You don't do the Battle of Guan Du for some reason. You literally just skip to Guan Yu's escape. Zhang Liao, Hong De, Ma Chao, Ma Dai, Zhen Ji, Zhang He, Huang Zhong, Wei Yan, Jiang Wei, Zhu Xu, Tai Shu Tzu, Sun Shang Xiang, Zhu Gadan, and Wen Young, who this time pathetically only gets one chapter. Some of those, um, obviously, they would only be getting like one or two battles under their thing, but then still, it gives the sort of personalization for each of the characters. I did include Sun Shang Xiang on that list, however, um, I would actually prefer it if she just stayed in Wu. But, you know, technically she does, does join Shu. People like to whine that Jim Sterling called this game the worst Dynasty Warriors made, which, to be honest, I don't really care if he thinks it's the worst or not. I have my own thoughts on this, and I'll sum it up like this. I think that this game ties with Dynasty Warriors 6 for the title of worst dynasty, heck, even worst main warriors game there is. And it's funny because if you turn a nine upside down, you get a six, so whatever. Now they're not tied as the worst games for the same reason. So Dynasty Warriors 6 does some things really fucking badly, like clones all have the same attacks, cutting characters, only 17 characters having stories, dumb weapon changes, and generally poor character redesigns across the board. And finally, how could I forget its greatest crime, the Renbu system. However, it does have some really cool features, like the character stories are really in-depth, with great characterization and solid character development across the board, and providing completely made-up stories for Sun Jian, Diao Chan, and Lu Bu, which are actually some of my favorite stories in a Warriors game. Real-time siege battles were pretty good, and duels. Whereas Dynasty Warriors 9, everything is below mediocre at best with no real thought put into what they needed in terms of progression in this game and anything to keep the players from getting bored. So, all in all, I think the positives and negatives of Dynasty Warriors 6 are probably on par with just the overall negativeness of Dynasty Warriors 9. Story. So, for those that don't know, Dynasty Warriors is based upon the novel Romance of the Three Kingdoms, which in turn is based loosely upon actual history. 
with each of those three having similarities and some differences depending on bias and in Dynasty Warriors case having limitations on characters so some characters fulfill the roles of others from the book and obviously not everyone is playable so quite a lot of events are skipped as well as some of the characters being made up or changed completely sometimes due to what is appropriate to show or express in media like you know Liu Bei resorting to cannibalism due to him and his men lacking resources and a Shahuji being essentially a kidnap and rape victim at the hands of Zhang Fei. Pretty tasteless stuff really. For some reason people are up in arms about Shahuji's inclusion because of her history, conveniently ignoring all the other unpleasant shit that happened in those days. Obviously they're going to change her you fucking thickos, but I've railed up on that enough for now. Each of the Dynasty Wars games have different ways of telling stories and tell it to varying degrees and one of the only good points about Dynasty Warriors 9 is that it's the game in the series that goes into the most detail which most people are happy about. However the presentation of the story is unholy levels of bad. What you are hearing now is my experience completing the game as the following characters Sun Jian, Sun Shan Xiang, Guan Yu, Pong De, Wen Young, Wang Yuanji, Xin Xiangyang, Lu Bu, Zhu Rong, Zhang Hui, Ma Chao, Zhang Chunhua, Dong Zhuo, Lu <laughs> Lingqi, Lian Xia, Guan Yinping, Cao Cao, Diao Chan, Yuan Chao, Zhang Liao, Zhu Xu, Sha Hu Ba, and Tai Chu Su, or Tai Chu Su, as the game likes to call him. I have no idea. So where to begin? Where to begin? The story this time is apparently individual character stories with the general story of the era in the background and I say apparently because there's very little character building outside of the really important characters. At most some of the characters they'll get a couple of lines of dialogue talking to themselves about what is happening. I also say this because despite all characters joining and leaving the story at different times they all share the same stages. There's no real unique set of stages as it were. Unlike say, you know, Dynasty Warriors 5, which had everyone have five stages, but not the same five stages. They were kind of hand-picked for each character with their thoughts on the situation between each battle. From my experience in this game, some of the characters have dialogue between the stages and others don't. They finish being a bystander in the convo scene and then it's straight into the mission. Fucking hell. A majority of the storytelling is done via conversation events where characters stand around and talk to each other about the upcoming battle, previous battle or just current events happening. Now this isn't an uncommon feature in games, in fact it's quite common in you know Senran Kagura, the Persona games use it, hell even Samurai Warriors started doing it from the fourth game onwards, but here the level of animation is just beyond pathetic, characters feel so lifeless in these scenes. They all just stand there with their hands by their sides, with the occasional hand gesture or facial expression. For comparison, here's a scene in Dragon Quest Heroes, you know, a game also developed by Koei. Now it would be unfair of me to say this is a totally bad way of telling a story. I mean it's pretty common in RPGs and other games like I listed earlier. However, in this game, everything around it is just so lifeless. When the characters stand around there, there's nothing happening. And when stuff does happen, it's so awkward. The game has weather effects that happen at random, so during these scenes it might rain, which the characters don't even react to, or like even flinch in the face of just being smashed in the face with buckets of water. They just stand there, in the middle of nowhere, while the rain comes down on them. And let's not forget the other piss poor presentation, this. This is supposed to be the final confrontation of chapter one, and this is the scene we get. Compare this to, say, you know, Dimes Warriors 7. On top of this, I guess I'll have to talk about the voice acting. Jesus Christ, it is so bad. Dong Zhuo sounds like Stone Cold Steve Austin with throat cancer, Zhang Jiao like Martin the Martian, etc, etc. You know all these things from Jim Sterling talking about them, but just Jesus Christ. <laughs> At last, you see the superiority of my intellect, Zhuge Liang. The battle is mine. So no one really knows why Koei changed the voice actors. There seems to be a bunch of theories as to why though. 
People say it's due to the voice actor strike, which doesn't make sense to me as the strike ended in September 2017. And let's not forget that Koei made Fire Emblem Warriors, which released in October of 2017, which included well-known voice actors like Matthew Mercer, who is also Taishi C in Dynasty Warriors. Sorry, I mean, was Taishi Tsu. Or as, it, as Dynasty Warriors 9 calls him, Taishi Su. Who the fuck is that? Now, Taishi Tsu. It is all up to your strength from here. I'm under the impression this was done for two things. Firstly, to cut cost, which should be pretty obvious at this point, which I also don't agree with. The other point, which links to the first, is I'm of the keen belief that Koei never intended to have English dubs. I really do think the dubs were added in at the last second as, you know, damage control. And by that I mean Koei were already getting flack for the weapon changes and the clones, and to a lesser degree open world. But no dubs would have been the final straw for some people when it comes to this series, hence why they've gone for the cheap ass route. Just another thing before I finish this section, which, you know, has been a bit all over the place. To top it off, you can only have one save game at a time. So whenever you select a new character, you have to overwrite your previous playthrough. So you know, something that's a step back from every game in the series since Dynasty Warriors 3. Well done. Open world. Now I'm not totally opposed to open world games, heck, my game of the year last year was one, that being Gravity Rush 2, as well as another all-time favourite game, Fallout New Vegas is as well. But both of those games being opposites in terms of a majority of their aspects, with Gravity Rush being a set character driven story and its open world is bustling with life, while Fallout has you create a character and you pretty much make your own story, with different outcomes to different situations. And the open world is, you know, a nuclear ridden wasteland. But the main thing about those two games is they have more mechanics to offer than just kill shit. For Gravity Rush 2, it's got some of the most variety in a game I've ever seen in some time in terms of side missions and just the way you handle every situation in the game. Every side mission offers something new and has a backstory for each of them, while Fallout offers different ways to missions. You can be a pacifist if you want, you can choose to be a good guy or a bad guy. I think Fallout New Vegas has four different endings depending on your karma and depending on who you decide to align with, leading to a different set of missions, which is always cool. And so with those two games in mind, I will probably ma be making a, a few comparisons between them and Dynasty Warriors 9, or just keep that in mind when we talk about this game. Open world in Dynasty Warriors 9, this to me is what has utterly destroyed the game and potentially the series. I personally cannot see a benefit that this game gets from being open world. It's big, I'll give it that, but way too big for its own good. I think it's a pretty weird change for the series to take when the criticism levelled at the series recently has been the maps rely too much on having narrow pathways, which is, you know, pretty much every stage in Samurai Warriors 4 and its spin-offs. And you know, going open world is the solution to that somehow going in the complete opposite direction. Okay then. Going back to the realism thing, it looks like they did take a page from that too when it comes to the open world. They made it empty and fucking boring fields, just like real life. Maybe it's a bit harsh uh, to say empty, as some of the areas hilariously have about 400 tigers within 100 feet of each other. Realism confirmed. As well, the story is a large part of the problem for the open world, especially for Wei and Shu. Most of the story takes place in the top half of the map, meaning most of the interesting, and I use that word very loosely, stuff is stationed at the top half of the map, and the bottom half of China is very, very empty, with only two cities there, and from what I've discovered, no villages. So does no one live in that half of China or something? For comparison, here's a small area of Gravity Rush 2, and just look how many people are, are here compared to Dynasty Warriors 9. I think there might be more people here than in all of the cities in Dynasty Warriors 9 combined. It's just so lifeless in Dynasty Warriors, it's so sad. I know it's supposed to be a war, but where are even the troops outside of the battles? 
even Fallout New Vegas has more troops in the New Vegas Strip than Dying Suarez 9 has in some of its, you know, hub castles as I'd call it. Just everything about the open world is wrong for several reasons, which I will elaborate on. Battles are now spread across miles and miles of open land, which in my opinion makes the battles feel very similar to each other, uninteresting and anticlimactic. For example, the Battle of Shapi on Lu Bu's side is a battle where you are besieged by Saxo's forces. Now in Dynasty Warriors 8 and the remake of the stage in Extreme Legends, it was a battle that felt like you were on the losing side and you'd have to help your allies otherwise they'd defect away. There was a sense of urgency. Here in Dynasty Warriors 9 it's so spread out across the mass open fuckallery of this game that there's no feeling of having to defend the castle from the attackers. Not only this, across the whole game the majority of enemy units stay stationary because side missions and main missions, in fact, in this game don't move, they just sit there and wait for you to reach them. Another thing I've noticed is each side in each conflict seems to have about the same amount of troops. There's no, you know, we're outnumbered, shit we need to get stuff done, or you know, you have the overwhelming advantage against elite troops or anything. Whereas, you know, in, in the other games they didn't do that so much, but at least in some stages, like Herfei in Dinosaur Wars 8, at least you were outnumbered, it actually felt like you were being surrounded. In this game, it's just so... It's just so nothing. <sighs> Fucking hell. But let's not forget the Battle of Changban. Now, traditionally, it's one of the more unique stages where you protect Liu Bei as the Shu forces or pursue him on Wayside and a battle you would most likely lose if you took too long trying to defeat everyone. Here in Dynasty Warriors 9, for Wayside at least, Liu Bei doesn't move. He just sits there waiting for you to kill him. And as Jimbo Sterling mentioned, Zhang Fei protects the Changban Bridge that is absolutely miles away from everyone else. He's all out on his own, at least for Wei. If you're on the Shu side, Sha Hu Ji joins in with no sort of context. She's just there, whatever. So with that, most, if not all, the battles feel the same with only minor and non-mission or story-related characters and units moving which they do at random, as they can just fast travel like you do when you do. Great. Battles feature missions which are spread across the map. Some of them don't really make sense in terms of placement, like there's no actual battle line in the game. It's like each battle is just one big free-for-all. Missions are listed in the pause menu with a brief description and what rewards will be given, as well as the recommended level for you to be when attempting the mission. Most missions are go here, kill shit like normal, but there are a few have a bit more to do, like buying wine to make one of the officers drunk in the assault on Shappy. For me, the side missions get old really quick, as all the objectives, like I said earlier, are static. They just wait for you to get there. Some side missions do link into the story, mainly ones where people join your forces, like Huang Zhong, Zhong Wei and Pong De. However, if you ignore them, they join anyway, even if you decide to ignore the missions. Some of the side missions are even battles from the old games like Jie Ting, Chen Tang and Tian Shui are all condensed into one big battle in Shu's northern campaigns. And the Battle of Ding Tao and Pu Yang are now merged together as well. Like I mentioned earlier, there are levels in this game which is a major part of every character, generic officer, animals and, well, units in general have levels attached to them, which forms the difficulty of this game. When characters level up, you can spend three points in any of the stats your characters have, which is nice. And upon launch, there was actually no way to reset your points. Koei had to patch it in as a droppable rare item. How lovely! They could just, you know, have an NPC in the cities which you could talk to and pay them some gold to reset your stats. Jesus. So upon starting a battle, the main mission, which is the requirement for winning a battle, will be a vastly higher level than you are. So if you're level 50, the mission will be around, you know, level 70 to 75. Completing side missions lowers the main mission's level, as well as giving you experience to boot. 
The reason the main mission is always so high leveled is to prevent you from completing it first in a rather poor attempt to get you to complete other missions. I say poor attempts because despite enemies that are 10 levels or higher than you being immune to stagger, hitting harder and taking more damage, the game is still too easy. As charging your attacks negates their stagger immunity. Speaking of super powered enemies, Lubu. He is an absolute joke in this game this time around. I thought the idea of having him at Hulao Gate was that he stomps on players, but here you can kill him while being underleveled rather easily. You're told to avoid him in nearly every game, and the game you can avoid him the easiest is the one where he's the easiest to defeat. Make you think. Now a majority of the time spent in this game, at least when you start, is travelling on horseback from objective to objective, meeting groups of enemies along the way with five minute gaps between them. Now this is not totally dissimilar to the older games but just on a bigger scale, so any enjoyment you get from the combat is separated by this quite noticeable gap between enemies. Which I should remind people is the main aspect of the game and how you progress through the story is by killing stuff. Highly strange. Now that I've said the game has enemies to defeat on the way to each objective, the game doesn't ever encourage you to fight them. See, in older games, they were made in a way to promote defeating an officer in several ways. Firstly, in the older games, uh, enemy officers gave decent rewards to either power up your character in the form of permanent stat boosts, weapons, items, or horses and animals. As opposed to here in Dynasty Warriors 9, the chance of obtaining a weapon slash item scroll is very unlikely. Yes, you don't outright find weapons in this game, you get recipes, or scrolls as they call them, which you need three of to make any sort of decent weapon, but whatever. So in the older games, with the stat boosts, uh, they provided a decent incentive to go out your way to defeat enemy officers. The games that have the stat boosts are Dinosaur Wars 3, 4, 5 and 7. Um, they also don't have leveling systems, so the only way to improve your stats are by getting these stat boosting items, meaning the more officers you kill, the easier the game gets in the long run. Second point, to a lesser degree, enemy officers were a threat in the older games now because the whole battle would be visible on the map. You can see where enemy units are, and the battlefields were smaller, you could actually reach places in a decent time frame, whereas Dynasty Warriors 9, the battlefields are so big you'd never get anywhere if you had to prevent people from, you know, defeating your commander. Which hilariously, I had Chen Gong die on me whilst playing as Lu Bu, so reload the last checkpoint. Chen Gong spawns in a different place. What the fuck? So, now I've sort of railed upon that for a while, I have to talk about this now, the grappling hook. This single mechanic is the one that people hate the most, and I kind of do too. It's implemented so badly into this game, and it just trivialises battles as 95% of walls can be scaled with it. From what we saw when they were announcing this game, the grapple hook was supposed to be one of the methods for sieging a castle. You scale the walls, fight some troops, break the barricade on the door to open it for your allies to come in. The other easier method is that you wait for your allies to break down the gates with the battering ram, which takes absolutely years in this game. Well, let's put it this way, your allies are so ineffective that in 95 hours of playtime, they haven't broken through the gates once. So the grapple hook is basically the only choice you have really, but there's no real benefit in letting your allies in either, well seeing as they don't move during the night, I mean allies don't really do anything in this game at all, so it makes no difference. So it makes no difference either way. I do have some uh, solutions for the grapple hook issue. So number one, you make the grapple hook part of the bow and arrow, which uh, can solve a few things. Uh, it can prevent people from grappling everything, removing some of the triviality of this game. It would also make using the grapple hook a bit of a gamble, as you could make archers target you, um, slash enemies try to stagger you to prevent you from getting in. Or secondly, you steal the red zone idea from Samurai Warriors 4 and onwards. So to anybody that doesn't know what red zones are, they make enemies more aggressive, do more damage, receive less damage, and generally give you a hard time. In Samurai Warriors 4, where it was introduced, it was 
fairly decent way of locking off areas of the battlefield or stopping you from rushing the commander. What you could do is make the enemies on the insides of the castles harder to kill as 90% of the castles in this game use the same square layout. It wouldn't be too hard to make red zones. Just, you know, copy and paste them, the same as the castles. That'd be a fairly decent way and when you open the gates, then it dispels the red area, making it easier for you. It also links into you'd actually need to fix the AI so they'd actually fight with you. Whereas in like the older games, morale was a big part. If you were near more allies, it actually made the game a lot easier. I'm not sure if it's just an actual effect or the allied peons actually attack the other peons so they're not the enemies aren't staggering you as much. Maybe it's just me. Another reason I don't think Dynasty Warriors 9 uh, doesn't fit open world is the series just isn't capable of offering anything decent outside of combat. In Dynasty Warriors 9 they've added fishing and hunting, which is so bare bones it's honestly embarrassing. The fishing minigame boils down to go to a body of water, use some bait to start fishing and when you get a bite mash the button to catch the fish. That's it. There's so many ways they could have done it that would have been slightly more engaging from, you know, the mechanics in Persona 4 and 5, and even fucking Samurai Warriors Spirit Sanada provided better fishing, and didn't just mean you managed to catch fish with no effort. So the other mechanic I mentioned was hunting, which means they've brought back the bow from Dynasty Warriors 5 and before, which, like I said, pretty bare bones. Press down to draw the bow and attack button to fire, and triangle to crouch, which links into a basically non-existent stealth system where you press triangle to crouch and then suddenly people and animals don't see you at a certain distance. You do actually do slightly more damage from being hidden from what I've discovered, but it's just so... The, the indications that you've been spotted are almost comical. You get exclamation marks and question marks above the heads of the enemies when they think you've dis they've discovered you. Is that, is that the best they could do? Really? Jesus Christ. And, you know, the bow mechanic is actually the same for all characters. So for some characters it even clips through their um, bodies, like Dong Zhuo. Everyone uses the exact same thing. It's not like, you know, they had to individually tailor it to every character. I mean, they could have just done so much more. They could have, you know, actually done it so you could evade whilst using the bow and stuff like that. So in addition to battles in this game, there are quests, which are one of the most boring aspects of the game, which from my experience boil down to go here, kill something, or collect item for so-and-so. That is what I've gathered all this game has to offer in terms of side quests. You get a brief description in the menu, but there's no sort of backstory for, you know, why the blacksmiths have rebelled. Yes, some of the things are ministers and blacksmiths. They just hang around in the middle of nowhere waiting to die. They've rebelled, oh yes, of course. They could, you know, siege your castle or something. And finally, one thing I almost forgot are materials in this game. The game, in an effort to get people to explore the open world, has added materials which I find nothing wrong with. Heck, it even gets people to leave the pathways that the auto run always sets you on. Nope, my problem with this is just how it's handled. Materials of the same type are always found in clusters of about 10 or 12, meaning you never really have to go looking very far for the ones you want. But here's the problem, all the weapons require two of the same materials for all of them. Well, the epic weapons anyway. So because the materials are found in such large clusters, you can make the weapons and items within minutes. The open world had the potential, but Koei just didn't do anything with it. They could have added more to do, just using the basic ass mechanics they already had. They could have made quests more interesting, with you defeating bandits, leading to another mission where you fight the leader who is attacking a village or something. And they reward you with very rare items which you can use to make, you know, rare items. Or they could have had arenas in the main castles where there's like the challenge modes from Extreme Legends games. Or you could have horse racing too. You could just, you know, 
add anything to add variety in this game, but there's just nothing but trees, with the occasional same looking castles dotted around. And like I said earlier, you just the side quests are just so boring. You could have added like little stories to them. It doesn't really matter who does it, you just, you know, change the dialogue a bit. Yeah, it's just so pointless you don't even know why they bothered. Combat. Like I said earlier, I have mixed feelings with this. I like the fluidity of it. The new combat is composed of what the game calls flow attacks, trigger attacks, and reactive attacks. Flow attacks are square attacks from the old games, basically. Trigger attacks are R1 plus square, triangle, or X, which start off a new flow attack chain if they connect. The easiest way for me to explain is with this diagram. So what I like about this is that trigger attacks can be cancelled into during flow attacks and how each of the trigger attacks do the same as the old charge attack system. I especially like the R1 triangle string which launches enemies into the air and you follow up with the mid-air combo, which is a callback to Dynasty Warriors 3 and 4. It also links nicely into air missiles instead of having to awkwardly jump up and do them or using them when you're in a bad spot. In addition to those, reactive attacks, which all use the triangle button, um, these attacks change based upon what the enemy does. If they block, uh, the reactive attack breaks their guard. Sometimes that doesn't work. If the enemy attacks, it becomes a counter attack, much like a quick time event, which also sometimes doesn't work. And finally, there's another quick time event type attack which appears if you've depleted enough of an enemy's health bar. It just lets you kill them in one strike. The button always works, but sometimes the quick time event doesn't appear. The game doesn't actually tell you what the prerequisite for triggering that is. Like if you get over a hundred hit combo on them or something, it just never says. It just seems to appear at random. However, one thing I don't understand about this new combat is that why they didn't just implement the new trigger attack system onto the old charge attacks. Which, you know, generic officers have in this game, they use the old animations, so, so much for the It's hard for them to transfer the animations over to a new engine argument, which I, I've never really understood, like, if a, if a indie company can transfer all the stuff from the old Crash Bandicoot games, I'm pretty sure Koei can transfer something to a new engine from the previous fucking game. Where's your argument, you fucking shills? So let's also remember that charge attacks have been fine for Koei for basically every game except for Dynasty Warriors 1 and 6. Obviously, Dynasty Warriors 1 being a fighting game, which does actually have some of the animations come back in, you know, uh, Dynasty Warriors 2, so, you know, that's pretty weird. All the spin-off games, including Samurai Warriors, Dragon Quest Heroes, Hyrule Warriors, and Fire Emblem Warriors, as well as other games having variations of them. Games like, oh, I don't know, God of War? Speaking of which, thinking about it, God of War games actually have the R1 attacks plus the charge attack system. Maybe not to the same degree as what I'm suggesting, but, you know, it's there. And, you know, the God of War games are actually really good. Fucking weird, that. In addition, if they kept charge attacks, they wouldn't have alienated most of the old audience. So, you know, whatever. I should also mention some of the weapons in this game are just skins for shared moves, like the boomerang, axe and short pike are all the same, and in my opinion, one of the worst clones in the game, there's little to no variation, at least in my eyes, uh, it'll probably be noticeable when I'm editing it in, but as of now, um, I can't really see. As a result of this, all the characters in the games share moves with at least another character, with the exception of Lubu, he is the only unique. While we're here, the people that said before this game's launch, clones don't matter, fuck off. Seriously, fucking well, piss off. Yeah, clones don't matter in a game where the only thing on offer is the combat. It's the main draw of the series, and it's the way you progress through the game. The whole reason why some people play certain characters, 
There's also no real reason to play as a character as the combat is all generalised and the stories are all generalised and the overall story is the same recycled shit they've been telling for 20 years but clones don't matter in this game where the only thing you do is fucking hack and slash. Yeah, it doesn't fucking matter does it? Are these people fucking serious? I had a comment from somebody well known in the Koei community which, you know, is a bit of a fucking joke saying Oh, why are you picking on Koei there? And the Dynasty Warriors series is niche, but oh, let um, Final Fantasy XV get away with it. Yeah, it's almost like Final Fantasy is a fucking RPG with a different combat system, you thick cunt. Like, seriously, I get so fucking aggravated by people just being so dense that fucking light bends around them. Jesus Christ. I wasn't expecting to raise my blood pressure through the fucking roof in this video, but bloody hell. <sighs> so, speaking of the generalisation of the movesets and the game in general, they've removed character types from Dynasty Warriors 8 like Dash, Dive, Shadow Sprint and Whirlwind, which I thought was a fairly decent way to split the characters up. So for those that don't know, the types had different characteristics and a unique feature. Dash type characters could cancel attacks by jumping in the air as well as getting a second jump, a feature which everyone has in Dynasty Warriors 9. Dive characters enabled you to evade after getting hit to avoid taking more damage. Shadow Sprint lets you follow up a charge attack with a dash attack which would usually knock enemies over or break their guard. And finally Whirlwind, uh, a gust of wind would appear around you whilst attacking which knocks enemies away and does slightly more damage. In Dynasty Wars 9 they've binned all of these and elected to give everyone the ability to double jump which I actually understand it's to make everybody um, more able to traverse the terrain easier except the jump height is so pathetic that you have to use the grapple hook to get out of water when the platform height is you know this low absolute fucking mad lad <laughs> now most people should know by now in my opinion on clones if you don't clones are dumb as fuck and shouldn't be happening in this series at all especially this late into the series and even more so when the previous game in the series had everyone unique and even had move sets to spare it just boggles the fucking mind this game and Koei are the ones that cause all these issues it's their fault they keep adding characters, meaning the workload for any change in the combat takes up so much time, effort and money now. That being said, they don't even use the time or effort to do it. Expand upon what you have. <sighs> Linking into the combat is also the AI difficulty, which boy oh boy did they mess up. There might as well be no AI in this game. Generals very rarely fight back in the launch version of the game, but as of patch 1.04 they do fight back more only slightly makes me embarrassed to say as of a patch they couldn't even get a decent level of fighting in the AI on release well done you can't improve on games that came out 17 years ago as well as that before that patch you used to be able to juggle named officers to death as they wouldn't even bother to flip out of the air which they do now, I believe. I sort of gave up playing the game after a certain while. It just got so boring. A very little challenge. On harder difficulties, the enemy officers have a tendency to evade nearly all the time and it's really annoying. I wouldn't really say harder difficulties make the game more fun. If anything, it gets boring quicker as officers that are even several levels below you are now able to tank a shed load of damage. So weapons and crafting, this is another thing Koei have tried to sort of copy from RPGs. Because Koei haven't expanded upon anything from the previous game, just like the rest of it, the weapon upgrade system gets an overhaul. This time, weapon attributes are linked to gems. Gems come in a few different flavours, linked to the elements from the previous games, and sometimes none at all. The different elemental gems get a fixed passive abilities on them but the other bonus stats are always random because you know reasons I have no idea why they've added this random element presumably to stop people from using the same build for every weapon some of which are pretty broken anyway like wind gems add attack speed so if you have six 
you can attack like, you know, anything. Attack like the wind. Uh, and for the lightning orb, you regenerate Maso per second. Up to, from what I've seen, a maximum of 6 plus second for every gem. So if you have 6, you get 36 Maso a second. Okay then. Linking back to the progression thing here, they sort of fucked it up with the weapons. Okay, so that's maybe a bit harsh on the surface, but one thing they've done in this game is the further you get in, the higher the weapon grades get. So when it gets to about chapter 9, 10 and 11, that's when you get epic tier weapons starting appearing. You know, the ones that were fifth weapons in Dynasty Warriors 8. Yeah, those. Now, I'm not opposed to Koei reusing them, but they didn't even add new ones for characters that change their weapons. Like, really? They should have been like the easiest thing for them to do. Not only that, but most of the weapons that people change to are weapon skins from the previous games, like Ma Dai, Lu Ling Chi, and Xia Ho Yuan are all using fourth weapon skins from Dynasty Warriors 8. They couldn't even be bothered to make new ones. Like. In regards to weapons themselves in this game, you don't find weapons or items, you obtain scrolls. For any sort of gear, you need scrolls to make the weapon or item, and for any of the decent stuff, you need three of them. And weapons this time aren't sellable, just like Dynasty Warriors 7, meaning loads of the weapons you will gain will never be used. Scrolls, like I said, are needed to make gear. Thankfully, once you gain the right amount of scrolls, you don't need any more. Well, for items at least, as you can only make the weapons once as you can't have more than one weapon on you at once. But for items, after you have the scroll, you only need the materials to make them several times, which you might need to do if you want the best stats, as it's randomised. One solution is they could have made the stats part of crafting, like Samurai Warriors Spirit Sanator, where to boost the stats of a weapon you need certain materials, thus negating the random element completely and probably would encourage people to go out and explore the game more, instead of using the same six gems over and over, which I always do. There's no reason for me to go out of my way to make more, as you can add and remove gems from weapons as freely as you want. And if you made weapons drop from enemies with random stats, then you'd have your way of balancing the game too in terms of weapon progression, instead of just getting it from the start because you managed to find the area which drops the special coins to buy the scrolls. And then, because none of the materials are locked behind, you know, completing certain missions in the story, which would be sort of a term of, um, which would be a decent way of progression, you can just get epic weapons at the start of the game. There's literally no reason to use any of the other weapons. Another thing they could have done is, um, get this, make old costumes craftable items. You know, the ones that in the PS2 games used to be unlocked for reaching a certain rank. If they made it so you could make more outfits, it would at least be something for players to do. Speaking of costumes though, there are alternates in this game, but you can't use them in battle. Why? Like, they're just the skin, just like, you know, half the characters in this game are skins for other characters. Jesus Christ. So final thoughts, um, avoid this game at all costs. I genuinely wish this game never existed. I've seen people defend this game with the argument with, well, they have a good base for the rest of the series to build upon. Really? <laughs> They've only been making these games for, you know, 20 years. This should have been the one with the most effort put into to, you know, celebrate 20 years and show how far they've come and build upon what the series does best and what people like. Their lack of innovation and small changes per game has led to this shit heap. And besides, every game in the series has been a good base to build upon, but Koei never do. They milk every game in this series to the point that everyone is burned out by these games. So they try something radical and it falls flat as it's so far removed from what people like and want. Overall, the fallout from this game has been massive, and to be honest, I think there's a lot of eyes on Koei to see how they'll recover from this, if they recover at all. That is how bad this game is. Which, their plan of action is to release the main piece of Season Pass DLC in the summer to a dead player base, which, you know, doesn't help anybody. 
the direction of some other games are slash were depending on the outcome of this game like Samurai Warriors 5 and Sengoku Basura 5 both of which have had tease announcements. To Ko's credit they are trying to patch the game with the current one actually making the AI move. I mean if that doesn't make the game look like a rushed piece of shit I don't know what does. But in my opinion I think it's too late. The first week of sales are usually what determines the success of a game and the damage is already done. Some of the flaws of this game, let's be honest, won't be made better by patching it. It's like trying to put a plaster over a gunshot wound. The open world will still be nothing but fucking miles and miles of the same looking trees. The crafting system will still have the randomised stats and values. The storytelling will still have the same amount of life as a graveyard. The only people that will benefit from the game being heavily patched are the people already playing it and, you know, the hardcore fans, which can accept, you know, a broken mess of a game. This game to me is the result of Koei cutting corners and being too lazy for too long and finally getting caught out for it. The last couple of Warriors games have had, let's say, mixed responses. Berserk was pretty bad, Warriors All-Stars hated by the community but seemingly liked by most reviewers except for guess who jim sterling funny how he's right about this game but not dynasty warriors 9 fire emblem pretty good but has the worst examples of clones in a warriors game ever since you know dynasty warriors 6 samurai warriors spirit sanada was basically an asset flip and sh should have been the game that you know samurai warriors 4 2 was for some reason koei has tried to reinvent the wheel with this game but the shame the design they went for was a fucking square. Like, why not just improve on what you already had and what people liked and iron out the flaws which the games have had for years? Open world isn't the solution to the drop in sales for the games. In fact, it's done the opposite. Dinosaur Wars 9 has sold less than Dinosaur Wars 8 and they've lost fans because of this. There's perfectly decent examples of games building upon a decent formula which people liked, but then they also don't release you know, 200 games a year. Persona 5 is the culmination of building up from Persona 3, 4 and 4 Golden. Monster Hunter, exactly the same. Just, it's just embarrassing. Just any sequel usually builds upon what the previous games did well and try and get rid of some of the flaws. Dynasty Warriors is a reinvent every time, but there's so little innovation. They don't even try and iron out the problems. So to summarise, the open world doesn't work, there are so many oversights in this game, like going to Chengdu whilst being a way officer and not being confronted. Seemingly no one owns any land in this game, you never get attacked by their forces while free roaming in their provinces. Bandits and animals appear from thin air and seemingly live nowhere either. The side quests are boring, the combat is mindless, you can infinitely attack enemies and they won't attack back, or more like they can because they can be continuously juggled to death. The open world is empty, you're never really encouraged to explore, only when you want materials, most of which are in clusters. Battles in this game are a joke, all objectives are static, only one castle ever felt like a classic battle from the older games. You're never really encouraged to fight peons in the game either, or enemies in the camps, as allied forces are useless, especially at night because they won't move at all. Crafting was and is pointless as the stats are randomised. Ultimate weapons can be made within minutes as you can find the materials. There's nothing like a material that can only be gotten via a character's story or something. The weapon models are ripped from Dinosaur Wars 8 or just recoloured. There's only one ultimate weapon per type ripped from Dinosaur Wars 8 again. The combat is okay but could have been added to the existing charge attack system so they wouldn't have needed to clone all characters except for Lubu. They shouldn't have rushed this game, Koei have been taking the piss for too long. This was their chance for the Warriors franchise to make a difference, but they abandoned most, if not all, of what people liked about Dynasty Warriors 8. The Samurai Warriors series has had progression in terms of mechanics, but when it comes to this series, they've had Dynasty Warriors 2 to 5 with progression, but suddenly Dynasty Warriors 6 throws that all out and they've repeated it with Dinosaur Wars 7 and 8, showing signs of going in the right direction, then most of what people liked is thrown out for this fucking garbage. Honestly though, this franchise is almost dead after this game. I would encourage Koei to listen to the fan feedback on this. Ultimately, we are the people that enable Koei to keep making these games, and this was the game that's 
was the straw that broke the camel's back, so to speak, for the constant re-releases, spin-offs, and general laziness they've gotten away with for so often. It's a joke, and if the series is so niche, which people like to uh, throw around, although it being one of the most mentioned uh, game series on what used to be the Game Station podcast, yes, and uh, most of us being returning frat fans from what essentially was the first meme game being Dinosaur Wars 3 because it had such hilariously bad voice acting. You know, we are the people that enable them to do this. Um, I'm not sure if, you know, us not buying the games would make a difference because I'm pretty sure they only go by the Japanese uh, fan base and how much they sort of buy of the games. So hopefully there's a massive outcry from them uh, for Koei to sort of get their shit together, which uh, Koei getting their shit together, the PC version of the game was actually uh, developed by another studio, which they had to patch out the Chinese dubs because Koei couldn't liaise with them to actually get the licenses to keep it in the game, so it got patched out, and a month later they got put back in. I mean, this is also a company that said Dynasty Warriors 8 Empires would be having English dubs, and they didn't even get that right. I mean, they couldn't liaise with their Japanese side of the company and get the funding to make the English dubs. Jesus Christ. There we go, it's finally over. I never want to make a video about this fucking game again. This review has made me pretty sad, pretty angry, and it was pretty unenjoyable writing it, recording it, fucking gonna be pretty depressing editing it as well. And this review is, to be honest, by my standards, pretty bad and pretty all over the place. But to be honest, at the end, it was becoming so depressing. So the next couple of games I will review will be actually ones I actually like and they're good. I never want to make a video on this fucking game ever again. That is how bad this game is. And, you know, I'm, be I'm guessing people will probably respond to this, so... You know, enjoy your shit, as Gordon Ramsay would say. Thank you very much, and piss off.